week, we had just gone through the discussion of how uh, Jesus, a priest after the order of uh, Melchizedek, uh, was superior to the Levitical priest. Um, and tonight we're starting in chapter five with verse 11. Um, and again, we're going to ask if I can get one of you astute readers to read 5, 11 through 14 for me. This is the ESV version that I'm showing. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull to hearing. For though this Sorry, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracle of God, oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is, the, is, for, mature, is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. All right, uh, thank you, Brother Cord. And so recall that the author of Hebrews has been creating, if you will, sort of a case to demonstrate how the church in Hebrews need to return to the word and be more diligent about growing and to remove themselves from some of the pressures of being in Rome, of being near their traditional uh, Judaism uh, religion, and uh, to move forward in learning and studying of Christ. And what we've seen is there's often a comparison that is done first, like with Jesus and uh, the Levitical priest, and then he comes back and he'll either encourage, admonish, or warn. So he's back to a situation where he would like to go further in explaining to them more of what they should know at this point, but because they have become dull of hearing, he's not able to talk to them at the level that he would like to talk to them. So um, he's now looking and warning them of their inability to handle in-depth information about Christ the Savior because they show a reluctancy or a slowness to seek growth and development. Uh, he goes even further to say that they have been on this walk long enough to be receivers of great truths and details, and they ought to be teachers by now, but because of their slowness and their lack of commitment, they are still in need of someone to hand feed them um, and he's telling his audience that you have an issue that you must address. And this is across the congregational body. Uh, so if churches don't get past the milk stage of hearing how good Christ is and that he is able to forgive sins, they will never get to the work required of them as disciples. Their knowledge will be surface level. They are susceptible to false teachings and members can easily be lured away. And as you will see in the scriptures that come up, this is not just a head condition and making a decision to learn of God. This is a heart condition and having a desire to know God. And in verse 14, he says, but solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So just for thought and consideration, how does being a member capable of consuming solid food benefit our members, our church, our community, the lost? It helps if we're able to consume solid food, we can go into the deeper things of the 
of um, our faith and we can help disciple others. What, what would you expect to see in the church? I would expect to see the church <laughs> spending more time in study, more time in in discussing the word, um, living it out, not just surface level stuff, but actually living living the scriptures out. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as like the church in Acts 2, uh, I think around the 42nd verse, where we saw how they had all things in common, how they worship together, fellowship together, uh, really treated their family as a community and made sure that everybody in that community was okay, right? Um, and believers who remain new in Christ are unable to use the word to help make solid godly choices. This is the capability of those who are ready for solid food. They have practiced diligently in the faith and grown their senses to discern both good and evil. Um, and there's an adage that says, an axiom that says, where there is life, there is expected growth. And if there is no growth, you see a prune, because if you don't prune, uh, the roots or the tree will become infested and could potentially die. So when you do not grow in Christ, you actually start to shrink. You actually start to even lose the knowledge and the information you had because you're not practicing and being familiar with it. And so the author of Hebrews was concerned that this was becoming the situation of the church, and he was concerned that they were becoming stagnant in their growth and their ability to survive in the environment they were in, persecution of Rome, the potential of slipping back into the old religious practices of Judaism, uh, and also just their ongoing struggles that they were having individually. But moving on to chapter six, uh, can I get someone to read that please? Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Thank you, Sister Jane. So let's stop for a second and think about Mount Zion. When Mount Zion has a new convert or someone that comes forward and says that they have a desire to trust in Christ, what do we do? How do we treat that person? Welcome him in and bring him through new members class. Welcome him in and bring him through new members class. Excellent. And then what? I'll look at the elephant in the room and just say after they go to new members class, we automatically treat them like they're a mature believer. Okay. Do we have an expectation for them or of them? I personally believe that we put an expectation on them, but then we really have to start looking back at ourselves because when we first came to Christ, we didn't have it all together. So it's also, we have to remember that everyone starts at a different level when you come to Christ. We're all on equal footing ground. You're all immature. We're all immature in Christ when we first come to Christ. But um, as you go along this walk together, um, that's really the key in there is being together um, in this walk of Christianity and walking with Christ. There should be growth. 
Um, we need to, and that's where it goes into uh, how it was explained in Timothy for the word is good for rebuking, for correcting, and all of this is done. We should be doing it in love instead of um, just kind of doing it as a judgmental, hey, look, you're a Christian now. You should know better. You don't do this. You don't do this. You don't do this. If you, when you come to Christ, I can just speak for myself. I didn't have it all together. I thought certain things were fine. And as I grew in my walk with Christ, I learned, okay, maybe this is not fine. So it's like you're trained one way for so long that that becomes your uh, regular thinking process, your regular model of how you uh, live and how you react. When you come to Christ, it's like all that changes. You still have that old nature, but it's a change that should be taking place in there. So that's all, it all comes back to, there needs to be growth together. There needs to be walking together. There needs to be discipling together. There needs to be evangelizing together. Right, right. I, I, I like that brother AJ, that's a, a good question for reflection because um, like Brother Jay stated, there should be a togetherness. There should be walking hand in hand. And I don't know. I don't know. That's why I say it's a good reflection question because I don't know if that is actually occurring. Because I know that when after they finish the new members class, new members are a part of the family. And now they're in the family. And so sometimes being in the family, we just we have we have expectation of them that they would come out to the different teachings and come out to the different workshops so that they can grow. But are we walking hand in hand, encouraging and helping them to, to grow? That I, I'm not sure. Well, well it's, it's definitely good to turn the looking glass on ourselves and ask us how are we helping and how are we facilitating so that we can improve that process and how those members get acclimated into Christ. Um, the thing that we also want to recognize, but what I wanted to get out of that most though, is that we don't expect the people to stay where they are or continue um, in the same situation they were in. What you would expect is at least a conversion or a desire to change in the people because as they come to know Christ, the desire is to turn it over to him and to live according to his way. And, and what you would want to see over time is growth and change in someone that is making the decision to trust in Christ, right? Um, and again, talking about growth, what you would want is for them to go beyond just the basic elements that we start them with in new members class, telling them about the ordinance of the church, helping them understand Jesus, helping them understand uh, salvation, helping them understand that they are a sinner and they're lost and that without Christ, they're on their way to hell. You would want them to get beyond that, not forgetting that, but definitely getting beyond that and, and practicing um, more in their Christian law. And, and I do think that one thing that we at least try to do with some of the new members is we try to find out what they're interested in and get them serving in a ministry because within the ministry now, they have a direct connection, engagement, and cultivation um, of, them, of themselves in the church and an opportunity uh, to move forward. So, so I definitely appreciate that feedback. And then he goes on to say in Hebrews 6 and 3, and this we will do if God permits. And, and that's not tongue in cheek. That's not God willing and the creek don't rise. That's a true acknowledgement that in order for them, us to accomplish the things that God would have us to do, we can do that, but it's going to occur with the divine help of God helping us through what we're attempting to do as we serve him. And this also ties back to Hebrews 4 and 11, where the author encouraged the Jewish Christians to strive to stay with Jesus for the sake of inheriting the promises. Uh, we know that we want us to do all we can do 
to make sure that we're striving for God. But we can't overlook the fact that it is ultimately God and our trust in God uh, that will help us be successful. I want to move on to Hebrews 6, 4, and 6, and, and uh, these verses right here. AJ. Um, yes, sir. Before you move on, uh, I read something that um, that Pastor Harris had just put in the in, uh, chat. Talking about it, it's hard to see, especially those who are young and to discipled by mature believers. And he went on to say, that's why we we so much training and making disciple disciples but there's room to get better to make sure this happens well what i would say is that even even with the training even with the encouragement until we as a mature believer is willing to sacrifice some of our time and some of our energy to connecting with those it it, it it's all for naught because if everybody goes back and you look at Acts, the disciples made a commitment to, you know, and it was like there was a willingness to sacrifice of themselves, others grow in the faith. And I and I think that we times we look for my time or we'll say, well, this is what I'll do because this fits into my schedule. But what you have to do is when we begin to move from uh, being on milk to food, we look at the example that he told us her earlier in, in Hebrews, which basically was Christ is that perfect example because he was sitting with the Father, communing with the Father, but was willing to come to this earth and go through all he went through so that we could have that privilege. And sometimes we have to be willing to make those sacrifices of what we consider to be our time and our treasures if we're mature. Great point, Bowser. And, and and the key there is, well, one key is the, if we're mature and recognize that ultimately if we're trying to be Christ-like, those were the things that Christ did and those are the things that we must do, right? Um, that's a big reason why we are doing the things we're doing and trying to encourage one another because we all know that we're being perfected. We aren't, perfect, we aren't perfect, right? Um, and there's a lot of work and opportunity for us to do. Um, can I get a reader for uh, Hebrews 4, 6, 4 through 6, please? For it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted God and the powers of the age to come. And when they have to restore them to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. I uh, thank you, uh, Deacon Bowser. So I, I'd like to have another discussion if possible. And I want to put the question out there that I think we talked about before is is it possible for a Christian to lose their salvation? And I can't read the chat, so if someone answers in the chat, please let me know. But I'm going to pause my speaking to hear yours. It's impossible for you to lose your salvation, but that's only if you've genuinely been converted. Okay. Anyone else? This is how we learn and grow and get ourselves on the same page and in the right place. Uh, so please feel free to share. There will be no judgment, especially from Barbara. Yeah. He's saying, if you are truly saved, there can be periods where you may fall into what they call a backside position. You may, um, in your level of growth and maturity, you can stumble and make mistakes, but that's it's important that we have the relationships and the ability to uh, know each other well enough that we can identify when, when brothers or sisters may be going through things. Because if we only know each other on the surface, 
know each other in a quick and fashionable manner, you won't fully understand when somebody's going through. But when you have that relationship with someone, you know them well enough, you can understand and know when they're going through. That's if that relationship is at a certain level. Uh, and then, of course, as we know, uh, there's the group out there who you're just truly not saved. And you, you may think you are. And then there's the group out there who, you know, they get caught up in the emotional part of it. And they don't understand that there's more to it, that there should be a, a willingness to want to learn more and build a greater relationship, not only with believers, but with God himself and know more about his son. If you're truly saved, you should want to you should want to know more about the God who planned the perfect plan for you. OK, there's another hard question coming, but I'm going to hold off on it. I think somebody will probably ask you. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, Bowser and uh, Jay, I believe. Uh, so this text uh, is actually called one of the harshest warnings in the New Testament uh, because it gives the impression that a Christian can fall away and it be impossible for them to be restored. This passage is actually interpreted four ways. One, that there's a danger of a Christian losing his salvation. But as we just talked about, if you are a true Christian, you can't lose your salvation because Jesus has told us that anyone that he is given by the Father, he will not lose, not lose one. So that's not the interpretation to take from this scripture. Uh, this is also possibly a warning against the mere profession of faith, like Bowser was saying, uh, that we may say we believe, we trust, and we actually don't. You don't lose your salvation, you never had it. Um, so that's not the focus of this text. And then it's possible, uh, he's saying hypothetically, if a Christian could lose their salvation, there is no provision for repentance. Um, there's a fourth one that we see and that the things I read point to and that this is a warning to Christians that aren't being obedient, aren't studying, and aren't walking in the will and word of God. Um, that they're in a position where they could become disqualified from service and inheriting glory. Not that they are, but that's the warning that the author in Hebrews wants to give to the church. He really wants to wake them up by letting them know you all aren't growing, you aren't getting mature, and if you have truly come into this walk, you have been enlightened to understand who Jesus is. You have tasted the heavenly gift and blessings. You have shared, shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of the word of God. And tasted here is not like sample. It's like, um, I think when, Tim, when Paul referred to Jesus as having tasted death, he went through death for the, our sake. Um, so these are actions that Christians experience. And for Christians who've experienced the actual connection with God to then turn around and renounce their faith, walk away from the faith, reject Christ, knowing that when they trusted in Christ, they acknowledged his crucifixion was unjust and that he paid the price for our sins by renouncing Christ. They are saying just as his enemies did, he deserved to die on the cross. And they are in essence, crucifying Jesus a second time. And from that, how can you restore someone who has gone through the full experience of being a Christian 
and then decides to walk away. If you are not practicing in Christ, if you are not growing in Christ, you can put yourself in a situation where you're at risk. Now, like you said, a Christian can't lose their salvation, but imagine the damage a Christian can do that has once been seen as a uh, mature practicing Christian to now not be mature and practicing in Christ. Uh, does anybody have an idea or a concept of how that could be an impact to others? Just, just like your walk is a testimony that demonstrates to others you serve God. If you turn from God, what you're showing others is that the desire, love, commitment you had for God, you've lost it. There's a risk of you influencing others away from God or challenging their walk in God because of the example you represent. And so when we talk about the need to grow in God, when we talk about the need to be a mature Christian so you can connect with others and help usher them along, there's a responsibility, there's a requirement, there's an expectation for us to help other Christians move along or our walk is the opposite of the testimony that we would like to give. And so the encouragement or the admonishing of the Hebrews church is that you all are at a serious risk of falling away, maybe not leaving Christ, but being rebellious, being seen as unrepentive, causing issues within your church uh, that could impact the growth of your church and the growth of others. And so as we go through Hebrews 6 and 7 and 8, uh, it says, For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed and it and its end is to be burned. AJ, I have a question. Because mm -hmm. you lost me a little bit back there when you were talking. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so I think I heard what you said. I think I understood what you said, but I'm not 100% sure. So if, I'm, if I have fallen away, maybe I didn't get it. I don't know. Okay, so if I'm, fall, if I'm falling away, and I've got, go back to your previous slide. Please, thank you. One more. No problem. No problem. Okay. Okay. So, an experienced Christian renouncing their faith. Were you talking about that? Yes. And then it goes down to, by, talks about by renouncing, oops, I'm sorry, I just hit my screen and lost the picture. Um, by renouncing your faith. By renouncing Christ, you're saying that you're saying just as his enemies did. So are you are you saying what I'm hearing is that I can renounce Christ and then I can have effect on other people? It sounds like and I know you can't, but it sounds like you're saying I can lose my salvation and I know that you can't. But just for people who might be seeing it a different way. Um, to what I would, if, to me, if I am truly, 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 truly in Christ, if my heart is truly where it should, where it should be, then I shouldn't get to that point. I, I agree. And, and so that's why I started with the discussion about can a true Christian lose their salvation? And the discussion was no, a true Christian can, right? Uh, right, and I heard that, but then right. I think when you went to the next part is where I was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a warning to the church explaining to them 
that if they're not careful and they get themselves into this position, not that they will, it's a warning, that if they get themselves into this position, they're in danger of becoming disqualified for further service to God. And to denounce Christ would be a public statement that they believe that Christ deserved to die um, and that his crucifixion was just, which would be like crucifying Christ a second time. And what the author is saying is, if you get into that situation, there is not an ability to restore you because you've gone through the relationship with Christ. And now if you're at a point of where you were walking away from Christ, how do you come back? What is the repenting when you've gone through all the blessings and the benefits of walking with Christ? So he is really issuing a strong warning to them to tell them to do the things necessary to not find yourself or to not get into this position. Yeah. So, so, so he's not saying it can happen. He's telling them, I warn you because I don't want you to get close to this situation because the way you're going, this is an outlet. Can, can I? Um, Please. So what Christ is saying, can I say not applied in this situation? Um, Sister, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, I can't. No. Can you hear me? Yes, please. I was saying that first John um, two nineteen applied here when it said that they went out from us and not of us. Like if you were truly a Christian, would you be denouncing? Christ, would you be walking away? Doesn't doesn't it say that that would mean you really weren't a Christian? You might have been religious, or but but would you have a true relationship with Christ and be a born again Christian and be able to walk away? So so let me. I, that's right. So when he said that they are not of us right they really weren't converted christians and so if they walked away they never had their salvation they were never christian all right uh and like we talked about earlier a christian true christian won't lose their salvation and this goes back to um in judgment when there will become that come to jesus and says we cast out demons in your name we did all of these things in your name and he says, depart from me, I do not know you. There will be some that think they are walking Christians, but in actuality, they don't have a relationship with Christ. So those cannot lose salvation because they never had it. And if we read our scriptures or, or refer to our scriptures, um, salvation is something that God does. So you cannot lose your salvation. So this is all about the author of Hebrew trying to warn the church of a situation that they're appearing to be in, that they are not growing. They were once on fire for Christ. They had gone through the conversion and they were doing the things that were expected, but then they became apathetic. They started listening to the traditional Judaism uh, uh, worshipers that were their neighbors. The pressures of being in Rome were starting to weigh them down. And what the author was telling them, you all must grow in Christ because the very things you need to help get you through this, you aren't taking the time to study and to learn and you're actually appearing to go in the other direction. 
And the risk of going in the other direction to the very extreme is to now de denounce Christ. And if you do that, there's no coming back from that. So I am urging you, I'm admonishing you, I'm telling you to do the things necessary to improve your situation and trust in, believe in God, because the route you're on doesn't demonstrate you want to be mature Christians or you want to grow in Christ. So this is a warning. This is not uh, uh, an assessment of where they're going. It's a warning of where they don't want to go. And AJ, I think- Go ahead, Pastor. It did. It did. So, cause, cause what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is that okay, you you can be a you can be Val kind of summed it up too. What I was saying. So that was Val kind of summed up my point as well. I mean, and I, it's not that I didn't understand it. I mean, I got what you said, but I was hearing something a little different. And so I just wanted to get a clarification because I know that you can be a Christian and you can be stagnant. Yeah. <laughs> But if your heart is in the right place, then and you have people surrounding you to help you, then you grow. Yeah, you you can even be rebellious, right? But uh, exactly. But but what you would hope is that your family around you, uh, in prayer and in action, will do the things necessary to try to help restore you. Pastor Harris, you gonna say something? Yeah, um, you know, of course, this, this is a very tough text to uh, interpret. And so, like AJ said, he went through the various ways. But keep in mind, too, that the original audience, too, as AJ mentioned, is he's talking to these uh, Jewish believers that have dealt with Judaism. So, you know, for them, if they went back into Judaism, they may not specifically say, I reject Jesus as Messiah, but they go back into Judaism to start practicing, say, sacrificial and the observances of all these uh, ceremonies, then in essence, they're then saying Jesus wasn't enough. Therefore, they're crucifying him again to their, you know, that's a sense in which, because they, you know, I got to do all these other things. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough, so I'm crucifying him again. So, in that sense, you can see how the warning to especially them, the Jewish believers, don't go back into Judaism because you start to practice those things, then you're in a sense saying it was okay to crucify him. Now, can a, can a real believer denounce Christ? I think it's very possible that a believer can for a season get to a point, like James says, from the truth. And uh, if they never come back, then that proves that they uh, were not a believer. Uh, but notice what the text says, right? And there's one interpretation that really hones in on, it says, since they are crucifying, that's kind of present tense. It's impossible while they're crucifying once again. So if they were in the moment, at the time that they're renouncing Christ, they're crucifying. If they, if they come out of that and stop crucifying him, then it's possible they come back to repentance of back to fruitful service unto the Lord. Um, so that's another way to look at it, too, as well, is while they're in the midst of that apostasy of kind of walking away, yeah, anything you say to them, they're probably not going to be brought back to repentance. But if God gets, then go back and say, you know what, Jesus is Lord, you know, he is going to go away from this, then I think that then that repentance could be is possible then. But while they're in the midst of it, while they are not, while they have crucified once again, while crucifying, um, yeah, it's impossible because they've experienced all these things, and, uh, and anything we say to them probably won't won't have them come back. Thanks for that. Any other questions? You want to be clear. All right, so moving on to uh, six and seven. For the land that was drunk, the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for the sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, 
it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So Christians who soak up God's word and demonstrate a walk to benefit others to which God would have them witness and disciple will receive a blessing from God. Conversely, Christians who do not ready themselves to be effective vessels and disciples of God and produce no good works are very close to being cursed and to being burned. That is to say, there's a chance for these Christians to move forward in Christ, but understand when they're talking about being burned, this metaphor is a metaphor of a land as a Christian, and the blessings that come from God allow the Christian to produce fruit. That fruit can be utilized for others. If there are Christians, because it refers to if it bears, it's the same piece of land that is being rained on by God and it produces no good works, it is very close to being cursed, not being cursed, and being burned. The burn there is not in the sense of being burned in hellfire. The burn there is some of the farmers know that sometimes you burn the field in order to remove it of what previously grew, enrich the soil, and try to grow something else, right? Because the soil is not producing something that is of value. And this is a recognition to us Christians that we're at risk, not of us going to hell, but if we're not producing our works, our outcomes could be burned because we're not producing the fruit that others can then cultivate and get a blessing from in God. Hey, AJ, yeah, I, I think this reminds me of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, where our works will be judged, right? And so it says in, in uh, verse 11, uh, 11 through 15, for no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be make, become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though him, he himself will be saved but only as through fire. So it seems to me too, as well, our heavenly rewards, um, our works that we do um, can be burnt if it has not been really found good on the foundation of Christ. And it'll be definitely revealed on the day of judgment. Right. And again, in his talking to the church, he is trying to warn them and trying to provoke them to move further in their walk with Christ uh, and giving them illustrations and examples of what could happen if they don't. All right, can I get somebody to read 6, 9 through 12 for me? All right, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Right, right. So, so after being very stern with them and being uh warning and alarming he's wanting to work his way back and get them to encouragement right it's, it's almost like if we were being admonished from pastor harris to say that we don't treat those that come into the church that 
aren't known, or I'm sorry, he may talk about another church that when they have visitors and strangers, the church doesn't do anything with them. And although that might be us, instead of him saying that's us, he might say, Tommy Chief, but that's not you guys. I don't worry about y'all doing that, right? Uh, but at the same time, he's planting the seed of awareness to say, you really need to think about this because you, you show tendencies that demonstrate this is a possibility for you. Uh, so in light of the stern warning and harsh possible outcomes, this audience in Hebrew should be encouraged as the writer feels better things which go along with salvation will also be for them. The author knows that God is just and the readers of the letter would not be disregarded by God. God would remember their works and the love that they have shown him by helping other believers by acknowledging their work and acknowledging God's recognition, he is encouraging them to continue their good works, much as we should continue in our faith and obedience in God and serving those who are in his family and helping gather those who are lost. And, and that, that goes back to what Bowser is saying, as mature Christians, there are things that we should be doing and we should be practicing uh, and, and the more I read and study the, the letter of Hebrews, this letter is relevant today, right? Uh, I think a lot of the sentiments, a lot of the things that are being discussed are things that we too should be mindful of to make sure that uh, as we're striving in our walk and as we're working with those in ministry and in the church, that we are doing the things necessary to, to help others, to encourage others, to stay in the word, to learn the word, to disciple, to do all the good works that God uh, has asked us to do so that we can show our love to God and also receive the rewards and benefits that come with being obedient. All right, so, uh, and now Hebrews 6, 11, 12. If they would diligently increase their pursuit of good works to go along with their faith, they would guarantee the hope of the promises which are awarded to those who persevere. Their earnest pursuit would also keep them from remaining slow or lazy, uh, which has marked their immaturity. And if we go back to the earlier verses, he told them that there was much that he wanted to talk to them about, but because of their immaturity or because of their uh, sluggish ears, uh, that he couldn't communicate some of those truths to them because they were not mature enough to receive it. The goal should be to please God and obtain the inheritance that is available to them through God's promises. All right, this is a long one. I, I need a great reader that doesn't mind spending a little time to read this one for me. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope we set to the hope set before us we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of melchizedek uh, thank you Jay. So 
So one of the models of faith to follow would be Abraham. He received an oath from God to be blessed by God that he would be multiplied into a nation which would be blessed. In Genesis 22, 16 and 18, and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemy and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And when God made his promise to Abraham, he doubled the guarantee by swearing by himself, thus reinforcing his commitment to bless and multiply Abraham. Knowing God is not able to lie and that his oath is extra assurance on top of his word, Abraham was all the more confident in the promise, just as we should be. For people swear by greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So it says, yeah. What this does, I don't think it was last week, but before when um, Sister Cynthia told us about the rest Mm -hmm. And knowing God's promise, I, I listen to this and we think about how God made a promise to Abraham. Now, all Abraham saw was the one son. So he saw that as an offspring. But if you think about today, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, weeks ago, we all are an extension of that offspring. And that promise and that oath that God had made to Abraham. And with that, then we should rest because it says here, God, it's impossible for him to lie. And I think that as we mature, and this is the part of that maturing part, is that when we begin to mature, we can lean on knowing that God is truly in control, no matter what we may be going through, and that because he can't lie, if he has us, he has us. And some people twist this because they want to make his promises about, well, claim it in his name and you're going to have it. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that relationship, that true relationship that we can rip in on this side in understanding who he is and that it is impossible for him to lie. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brother Bowser. So, so Bowser, you, you, all, you also touched on some of the things that I wanted to bring up, which was great. Um, the additional assurance of his word by giving his promise with an oath. And, and we know that it says we swear by things which aren't ours to swear by uh, and different from God. As soon as somebody tells me they're going to do something, and if they say, I promise, I say, uh oh, I know how that one's going to go. Because I don't know if you're telling me you promised because you're trying to convince me or you're trying to convince me. But uh, when God promises something, then we know we can count on it. Uh, uh, and he gave an oath and then a double guarantee by uh, making it a promise to Abraham. And, and Bowser, one of the things that you said that, that I like and I took out of the scripture too, he told Abraham that because of his faith, that his heirs and all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so what basically he did there is he promised you, he promised me, he promised everybody on this WebEx that we will be blessed. It's already decided. Not only did he promise it, he gave an oath on top of it. 
Now, for me personally, the issue comes again when Adrian gets in the way because I don't rest in that promise that I'm already blessed. I get out there and I stress over things instead of recognizing God told Abraham many years ago. He said, Adrian, you're going to be blessed many years ago. And he's blessed everybody between me and Abraham, all those generations, yet for whatever reason, I want to feel like I can't rest in the blessing that he promised many, many years ago and has been fulfilling ever since. So we have this as a sure, steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a priest, high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So as Jesus is our high priest has entered into the holy heaven realm, sitting at the right hand of God, we can rest assured in the hope we have in Christ that we will sit in, that, I'm sorry, sit in the inner sanctum behind the curtain where our Savior Jesus resides to intercede for us on our behalf and for all our needs and restoration. We have already been promised to be blessed. All we have to do is walk in our blessing and receive our blessing. And as a high priest forever, Jesus will be with us now and throughout eternity. And we have access to him to help us get through what we need to get through. We just have to realize we've already gotten through. Are there any questions on anything we covered tonight? All right, so hearing none, um, let me see. Uh, Minister Smith, Jay, would you mind praying us out? I'm going to ask for first, uh, I'd like to ask you to pray before I ask for prayer requests so that you can take note of the prayer requests as they've been. Uh, uh, is there anyone that has a prayer request? I do for the um for the, the uh, teachers staff when the students are preparing to go back to school. Um, hopefully they're going to make the right decision when it comes to what needs to be done. Yes, I like to continue to pray for my family. Um, we lost my mom's sister, and my aunt in New York. Okay. Anyone else? Um, pray for me while I I travel with the military, and um, I'll be away at training. I pray for Sister Kim Jackson. She had a surgery yesterday. Bring uh, now. Keep her in prayer. For the Oliver family, uh, for Peggy, Peggy Cradle and her um, loss of her brother, and all those that have lost loved ones. And of course, we pray for the congregation, and if there are members in the congregation that are in need of service or assistance, uh, please let us know, because that's something that we want to make sure that uh, we try to address, especially given the uh, current situations and challenges that our families are going. Yeah, under um, Elder Harrison's got uh, back surgery coming up Friday, so let's keep him keep him in prayer. And Sister um, Cheryl Martin had um, appendicitis. Um, I think she had that taken care of, so she. Thankfully, that's uh, uh, she's recovered. Let's keep her in prayer too. Um, my brother, he had to go back to the well. He had to go to the emergency room last night, um, and they were saying it was a potential stroke. But 
Um, and this would be like his second stroke. So just keep him in prayer. And just to pray for all of the believers, all of us, because we need prayer. We need to be strengthened in God's word and we just need to walk out in faith and do what he is calling for us to do so that we can be a disciple to those ones who are weak in the faith. All right. All hearts and minds focused on Christ. Father, you are. 